This is Andrew Rigney, and I'll be talking to you uh, briefly in the next 10 minutes about the use of a visual abstract to disseminate scientific research. Uh, over the next 10 minutes or so, I will be periodically referring to a visual abstract primer. Uh, this is an open source free PDF uh, available at the website listed there. Uh, that as we learn more about the visual abstract, how it's being adopted, uh, tips, tricks, and advice that people uh, are telling us uh, seem to work best uh, to disseminate research. Uh, we've added it into the primer uh, and then updated and disseminated. So I encourage you to periodically check back uh, at that website um, to see the latest version of the primer. What I want to try to do in these next few minutes is tell you a little bit of the backstory about how the visual abstract came to be and why. Uh, say a little bit about what's happened in the last year and a half, the impact it's had, and how it's been adopted by many journals and institutions. Uh, and then finally looking ahead to what are some of the opportunities now that it's been broadly adopted uh, where it may have some future use and broader application. What is a visual abstract? Uh, in the simplest explanation, uh, not to be redundant, uh, but it is a visual representation of the main findings typically found in the abstract portion of a research article. Uh, it is probably easiest actually for me to just show you a few, uh, and then I'll probably give you a better idea of what it is. Uh, here is one from the Annals of Surgery for a randomized trial of oral versus uh, IV antibiotics to prevent surgical site infections. This study has 579 people who were randomized to either IV only antibiotics or IV and oral antibiotics, and you can see the group that got both had lower infection rates. Here's another randomized trial, this one done in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, for patients with glioblastoma. Uh, one group was randomized to dual therapy, uh, while the other only single therapy. And you can see the median overall survival there uh, was no different uh, with a p-value of 0.6. Uh, here's one from Annals of Surgery again. This was a surgery, survey done of over 1,000 surgeons, asking them about barriers to developing surgical scientists. Uh, the top three responses were pressure to be clinically productive, excessive administrative duties, and concern about work-life balance. Uh, and then finally, here's just one more from the Annals of Surgery. Uh, this was actually an opinion piece, a perspective piece, not a research article per se, uh, that looked at hospital design and airport design and, and tried to compare what are some of the elements about airport process design that may be very helpful to integrate into how we build hospitals. Uh, so in just about a minute there, I was able to summarize and give you the punchline of four very different studies uh, from different journals. And while by no means are you an expert on any of those topics now that you've seen the visual abstract, if you had a limited amount of time to just choose one article that you want had enough uh, time to go ahead and read. Uh, this could be a very effective way for you to help you find the information that's most relevant to you. So a lot of people have started to compare visual abstracts almost like a movie trailer, in a sense just give you an idea about the works about to help you decide if you want to go on and read the whole article. So how do you find visual abstracts? Uh, at the moment, uh, they are mostly found on the social media web pages of different organizations. So if you go uh, on social media like Twitter uh, and look for the hashtag visual abstract, uh, that is often how you will find many of these. Um, they will often be on the uh, account of the journal uh, linked to uh, the article itself. So how did the uh, visual abstract come to be? So I used to live in London before going to medical school. I decided to defer uh, starting medical school, moved to London uh, and studied uh, architecture and planning. Uh, and while I was there, uh, this is a very popular intersection. And there's something peculiar about it in that when you looked on the road, it told you to look both ways. And that was a clear sign that you were in a tourist part of town. Uh, but what it uh, also meant was that my British friends would kind of joke um, that uh, you know, it, was always, it was only for the Americans who needed it. And I always said back as the American in the group, well, you know, if you for heaven forbid, had an accident um, and needed to go to a hospital. Um, certainly you're in London, a large capital city. There are plenty of great hospitals around. Uh, shouldn't be a problem getting timely uh, attention. Uh, my friends chuckled at the time, and I didn't realize why. Uh, and I realized later that London actually, in fact, did not have a coordinated trauma system. Uh, if you were in a trauma accident, you may be taken to a hospital that didn't have trauma services. Uh, you may be taken to a hospital that wasn't necessarily the one that was closest to you. Or when you arrived there, they didn't have the specialists that were needed uh, for your care. Uh, so fast forward a decade later. Uh, I've moved back to the States, I've gone to medical school, um, I've trained in general surgery, um, and I come across this article in the Annals of Surgery, which is the uh, premier journal in uh, our field, uh, and it's the impact of a pan-regional inclusive trauma system on quality of care. Uh, it turned out that five years ago, or about seven years ago, uh, London had implemented a regional trauma network uh, to address exactly the problems uh, that I had seen when I was there, uh, and I was quite excited, I thought this was a very important work, um, and so when I saw it shared on social media, I thought, oh, this is going to go viral, everyone's going to read about it, it's, it's really important research. Um, and here, here was sort of the um, dissemination extent. Uh, the article had been seen 2,000 times, the tweet about it. Uh, eight people went on to share it, uh, and then 81 times the article was visited. Uh, I was quite frustrated. Uh, our, uh, down the hall from where I was doing my research at the University of Michigan uh, was Justin Dimmick, who's the associate editor at Annals of Surgery. Um, and he asked if I could do something different uh, to disseminate research for Annals of Surgery if I thought that the work was really that important uh, and really ought to be communicated to a broader audience. Uh, and so here's what I came up with. This was the first visual abstract uh, back in 2016, uh, summarizing that exact paper. Uh, London trauma after establishing an inclusive coordinated trauma system. Access to a trauma specialist on first arrival went from 16 to 84%. Involvement of a senior clinician in the first half hour went from 38 to 92%. And improved survival for the patients who were critically ill 
went from 69 to 89 percent. Uh, now, I truthfully did this because I thought it was an interesting article. I enjoyed it. Uh, but I thought, you know, if I could just get a handful of more people to read it, um, I thought that would be great. Uh, but I was quite surprised by the impact. So within the first two weeks of sharing this visual abstract, uh, it had been seen 35,000 times. Uh, more than 160 people went on to share it. Uh, and the article itself was visited on the publisher's website more than 250 times, which was a threefold increase from what we had done before. Uh, so looking at the journal Annals of Surgery, I realized there were many important stories to tell. Uh, so over the next year, uh, we created more than 100 visual abstracts. Uh, but more than simply just create them because they were visually appealing, uh, we wanted to study does creating a visual abstract actually improve its dissemination. So we prospectively designed a crossover trial where we selected 44 research articles. Half of them were shared as a visual abstract first, and the other half were shared in a text-only format. After a four-week washout period, these same articles were then shared in the opposite format, which allowed us to compare them head-to-head -to, -head, uh, to understand what impact the visual abstract had on dissemination. So here's what we found. Uh, not to get too meta on you, but this is a visual abstract summarizing the impact of a visual abstract on article dissemination. Impressions, or the number of times the tweet was seen, went up nearly eightfold. The number of times people went on to share it went up eightfold. And the number of times that the article itself was actually visited on the publisher's website went up nearly threefold. Uh, now, to me, as someone who does research and publishes art research articles, uh, what's most important to me is not that people like the figure about my article, uh, but they actually went on to read the work. Uh, so this is really the most exciting finding for us, knowing that um, this was actually driving more people uh, to the full article itself. Uh, shortly after we started doing this, there were many uh, adopters of the visual abstract. Uh, the journal Stroke went so far as to make it a requirement, uh, and other journals have followed suit. Uh, U.S. News and World Report adopted it as part of their dissemination strategy um, in how they communicate their um, work for their annual hospital rankings. Uh, and many other uh, journals, either a few of the latest, were now over 60 uh, that have adopted the visual abstract, uh, including the New England Journal of Medicine, the BMJ, uh, most recently the CDC. Uh, and what's been fun is uh, as these journals started to do that, we were openly sharing uh, the templates that we were using at Annals of Surgery. Uh, and it's been really fun to watch each journal uh, take that template, but really make it their own, uh, put their own branding to it, their own style, their own character, um, but just keep the, the same principles and ideas um, intact. Uh, here are a few of the most recent, uh, again, just going on social media and looking up the visual abstract hashtag, um, you can find many of these. Uh, beyond uh, just journals, um, this is a seminar in the Philippines uh, at their national public health meeting, uh, where they started to use the visual abstract to start communicating uh, national public health priorities for their group. Uh, Cochrane Review, if I could think of a group that um, loves guidelines and maybe staying within the boundaries, uh, I was surprised that they uh, went on to share uh, the visual abstract um, as a way for their trainees to work on disseminating information. Uh, and it didn't hurt to have Atul Gawande also put in a good word for us early on, um, recommending that journals uh, pick up the visual abstract as well. So what's involved? How do, you, how do you do it? What's the secret sauce that gets you from a text abstract uh, that doesn't disseminate very far uh, to something visual uh, that is appealing and that people can quickly uh, get their mind around? Uh, so these are the components of an effective visual abstract um, in the most traditional format that are outlined here. Um, and within the primer that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we've really uh, added a number of sections that not only walk you through some important design principles, ideas, different templates, uh, but that also uh, have input from designers, different editors on different journals, um, who have all sort of shared their best tips and ideas um, on how to effectively create these. So I won't spend too much time on it, but just to say that um, a lot of people have generously donated uh, their knowledge and their tips on how to do this, um, and we've consolidated it all um, in the primer. So where do I see this going? Uh, I think there are a number of opportunities for the visual abstract to be adopted further, uh, and some of it's starting to happen already. So there's no question that it is working its way into a more formal curriculum. Uh, for example, UNC now teaches this at their School of Public Health. Uh, at Brown, it is now available in their medical school curriculum. Uh, and medical societies, such as the Association for Academic Surgery, have now put it into their uh, academic courses for professional development. Uh, in response to a lot of that formalization, uh, in the last year, we published guidelines on what we think an appropriate visual abstract should have, almost a checklist of sorts that uh, these are the essential things that need to be included uh, to help safeguard it from being a promotional or biased representation of the research, but in fact, just a visual summary of the work itself. Uh, beyond that, it's been really exciting to watch the adoption go further. Uh, there was a talk given a year ago uh, by Dr. Greenberg from the University of Wisconsin, um, and that talk had been really well received, watched many times uh, on YouTube, and a few months after that, uh, Dr. Chelsea Harris created a visual abstract of the talk, summarizing a few of its key points, and it was wonderful because it really uh, created a resurgence for the topic uh, and got a lot more people back uh, to watching that lecture again. Uh, this was an article that was sent to us by Atul Gawande about um, opioid stewardship. And what was interesting is uh, he, the article was published, we created the visual abstract, and almost in real time on social media you could watch as the visual abstract was being shared and being shared by people in the media, uh, the content of the work 
work its way quickly into the media itself. So it seems it has potential promise to be a way that we make our research and our work more accessible to the public. Uh, it's also been effective in really re-upping the shelf life of articles. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from authors uh, or people who've given grand rounds and slides saying, thank you for making that visual abstract. That was one last slide I had to make for my talk. And you can see it's easy for them to put the research right into their presentation. Uh, and sometimes reviving articles that haven't that have been published for years uh, that now have a visual abstract that are now recirculating and being discussed. Uh, and this is an area that I think is most exciting uh, to me as someone who spends most of my time right now in the hospital trying to provide optimal care for patients uh, is practice guidelines. So this was an article uh, written about antibiotic stewardship amongst surgeons, uh, a topic that I don't think if you talk to most surgeons, this would be the first, second, or first, third thing they'd be excited to talk about. Um, but this visual abstract quickly summarized a few um, practice guidelines that could be implemented uh, to improve antibiotic stewardship. I was quite surprised that this was actually one of the most um, shared and viewed articles at our journal last year, uh, with over 300 visits just in the first couple of weeks after this visual abstract was shared, and more than 49,000 impressions. Uh, so a final uh, thought, uh, this is just really a truthfully a quick overview of uh, the visual abstract. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that we uh, finished the fourth edition of the primer recently, already started walking, working on a fifth edition. So if you're listening to this, uh, I imagine this is of interest to you. If you start doing work in this area, you find things that are not in the primer that you think should be. If you find advice that wasn't present before that you think should be, uh, please let us know. We'll add it to the next edition. Uh, and I hope the spirit of the visual abstract continues to stay open source because I think it's best for science that we continue uh, to make our research as accessible as possible. So with that, I will say thank you, um, and uh, many people to acknowledge, including those listed here who contributed to the most recent version of the visual abstract. So with that, I will be happy to take your questions.